Welcome to episode 43 of FBI Retired Case File Review with Jerry Williams. I'm a retired agent writing crime fiction inspired by actual FBI cases. In this episode, we speak with former special agent Scott Moritz. Scott served in the FBI for nearly 10 years, and during his time in the Bureau, he focused on white-collar crime, domestic and international corruption, and money laundering investigations. While assigned to the New York Division, he was on an asset forfeiture squad, where he conducted parallel financial investigations alongside agents working organized crime and drug cases. Scott was responsible for locating the target's assets, including real estate, bank accounts, investments, and personal property items. Scott is interviewed about an asset forfeiture investigation he worked involving a Long Island waste hauler with ties to New York LCN families. He explains how seized documents revealed the connection between the mob guys, garbage men, and illegal assets. Since leaving the FBI, Scott has worked with a variety of organizations, government, and regulatory agencies to identify, triage, investigate, and mediate a wide variety of risk and complex financial crimes. Currently, he is a global leader for Providity Forensics and Managing Director in Providity's New York office. Before we get to the interview, I just need to say one thing. I know the FBI is in the news. I know I've said it before, but it's even more important for me to say it today. Thank you for your support of FBI Retired Case File Review and to the agents, current and retired, whose cases you follow on this podcast and in the news. Thank you so much. And thank you for those who have read and left a review of Pay to Play, my crime novel. It continues to do well on Amazon.com. And so I also want to make sure each and every episode, I thank you for your support of my author career also. Now here's the show. Hi, everyone. I want to welcome my guest, Scott Moritz. How are you, Scott? I'm well. How are you? I'm doing good. So this is going to be a really fascinating episode, I think, because one of the things that we've heard from previous episodes is that a lot of times what the FBI is able to charge drugs and organized crime enterprises with are really kind of white-collar crime charges. And you've had a chance to work a parallel investigation involving organized crime where the subject was charged with some of those uh, type of white collar violations. Uh, yes, Jerry. I, it, was, um, it was a really interesting case. You know, I worked a, a lot of cases in my nine and a half year career in, in the Bureau and the, um, the, the cases, it was against an individual and uh, a, a series of companies over which he exercised control, uh, the main company of which is something called Hickey's Carding, and the main subject's name was was Dennis Hickey. And it's uh, one of the um, interesting things about the case is most, you know, I mean, the New York area is kind of known for how uh, traditional organized crime, the, the, the five La Cosa Nostra crime families that are uh, notorious here in the New York metropolitan area, they've uh, long been known to have a, a stranglehold over the uh, private sanitation business, garbage companies, both residential and, and commercial carting companies. Typically, the RICO cases brought in those matters had to do with something called the property rights system, which was this illegal cartel that the La Cosa Nostra came up with, with the, 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 the premise being that stops individual customers of a carting company belong to a particular crime family and that could be, can be exchanged based on, you know, agreement, but that the customer has no right to change uh, who their provider is. It is the property of the crime family that to which a given private sanitation company, you know, sort of has claim to. It's almost like a drug corner. It, it it absolutely is very similar, and and that sort of is what has been historically 
at the heart of all of the RICO and racketeering cases brought by the state against these different cart- carting companies. You know, in part of the kind of the backstory in the in those RICO cases was the whole background on the property rights system. What makes the Hickey carting case somewhat unique is that that was not what was the case in this instance. It's a, and that's one of the things that I, you know, why I wanted to talk a little bit about this case today, because really what this was was a money laundering case. Well, before we get into it, give us a little idea about the experience and the skills that you brought to this investigation. When did you join the FBI, and why did you join the FBI? Well, I, um, so I entered on duty in uh, October of 1986 and um, served for just under 10 years as an FBI agent. As uh, you described me earlier, I'm a bit of a unicorn in that I left prior to going to retirement. But uh, this is something I, I always wanted to do. I always wanted to be in law enforcement. I always wanted to kind of be, um, you know, a, an investigator. And um, uh, one of the kind of big influences in my life is I'm the youngest of six kids. My one of my sisters was an assistant U.S. attorney, and when I sought her counsel, t- telling her I was, you know, putting on with different police departments and whatnot, she asked me, you know, if I considered the bureau, and uh, I had not because I actually didn't think that I had the right background, as I had the misconception that a lot of people did is that you either had to be a CPA or or an attorney, and, and uh, she put me in touch with uh, some agents that she knew, and then disabused me of my misconceptions and uh I put in and uh you know it's, it's probably one of the best things that ever happened to me professionally is is my um uh, my career in the FBI it's uh, something that uh, you know I I didn't leave the bureau cuz I was unhappy I didn't leave the bureau because I was disillusioned uh it was a difficult decision for me to make but it really had to do with uh, my kind of desire for upward mobility and the fact that my two older children or step or my stepchildren and there were visitation constraints that precluded me from you know moving outside the new york area so um so you know for that and a few other you know reasons i i decided to to leave before you know kind of doing a a full career so how many offices were you in? Was are you are you from New York? You ended up in the New York division. I I, I am. I, I am um I'm a native New Yorker. Back when I entered on duty though the the bureau didn't send people to I think that at the time it was top twelve offices. They uh they they and um and certainly not New York. Uh so my first office was, was Memphis, which was great. I was there for four years. Uh you know, kind of a pretty small Field office, 50 agents in headquarters city, total of around 72 agents back then. I don't know what it's like now. Uh, good, a great experience. You know, worked you know every conceivable violation that the bureau works, and I thought it really positioned me well to then, you know, uh, when, it, when it was time to come to a to a major field office like New York. Let's get uh, back to New York and start talking about that case. Can you give us a little bit of background about the main subject? Dennis Hickey, who is he? So, so Dennis Hickey was a longtime owner of a private sanitation company in New York. We use the term carting company. He came, first came to the attention of the government um, when there was a, a very large civil RICO case being brought against um, most of the Long Island-based carting companies and their membership in something called the Long Island Cartmen's Association, which the government was asserting was a cartel. So the civil RICO case was brought, and a lot was learned about really every participant um, in the industry on Long Island. And the case agent for that uh, was this guy, Don McCormick, who had this already encyclopedic knowledge about organized crime and their control over the the carding industry, and he was the right guy to bring that case. The Hickey carding case sort of was a spinoff from that case when it was learned that uh, Dennis Hickey had uh, paid a bribe to a scales official. So when it, when a garbage you know truck is full and goes to the dump, uh, it drives onto a scale. Uh, and you know it's they already have recorded the empty weight of the truck, and then they weigh the truck, and then they charge the permit holder 
the company that owns that particular truck by the by the pound for what they are then dumping. And obviously, there's some uh, benefit uh, to being charged less than what you owe, uh, such that sometimes bribes are paid to the scales officials. Well, Dennis Hickey was convicted of bribing a scales official in the town of Islip, which is not just a town. It's like a township. It's almost like a sub-county. It's a large area. And as a result of that bribery, arrest, and conviction, he was debarred from doing business in the county, which accounted for uh, or excuse me, in the uh, in the town of Islip, which accounted for most of his business. So he was in a in a fix. Um, and who charged him with this? Was this a a local or a state charge? It, it was it was a it was a it was a county charge. He was he was and he and he served time for it. You know, this is a guy that the local newspaper uh, on Long Island, which is called Newsday, had kind of made it into a folk hero. He uh, there are some stories about him and, and feature stories about him. You know, they were very intrigued by him because he's somewhat of an eccentric guy. Uh, he moved into this very wealthy area with these gated homes and mansions up on, you know, overlooking the the, uh, the Long Island Sound. Very, very, you know, kind of um, old money families all in the, all in these manor homes all around him. And he first got some notoriety because he mounted two gold-plated garbage cans on the wrought iron gates in this grand entrance to his mansion and his neighbors complained to the town and the town tried to get him to take down the gold-plated garbage cans to which he responded not by removing them but by adding 10 more uh, <laughs> as a way of saying you know your, your neighbor's a garbage man and and uh, you know this is you know this the, you know he he took on this mythical sort of stature from that point on and you know that that home it, it kind of made it into almost like a graceland sort of place there was the the highest flying american flag flagpole on in new york um he had um some giant bull kind of in similar in scale and dimension to the one at the you know right by the um uh, the new york stock exchange some gigantic you know 10 foot tall chicken sculpture for what reason I have no idea. He was an odd guy and he had these very odd ornaments and I think a lot of it was in an effort to stick his thumb in the eye of his neighbors who he got off to the wrong foot with. But he's uh um you know th- like I said they they kind of made him into this mythical figure, this folk hero. But this case sort of debunked that uh and and kind of held him held him out to what he was, which is a as an organized crime a, a, a associate and a thug. And the initial bribery of the scales uh, employee, did they make a connection to organized crime in that initial county case? They did not. I mean, he was already known to law enforcement as an organized crime associate. I mean, it, it's not quite as prevalent now as it was then, but it was also kind of a given that if you were in the garbage business, then you owed your livelihood to the the, the good graces of one or more crime families. Let me ask you another question, because you're saying that he lived in this mansion-like house. I I guess the garbage business is a pretty lucrative business. It is. I mean, you can can make legitimately very good money. You know, the problem is you couldn't at the time in New York, because uh, not without uh, being, you know, associated with organized crime, because uh, there are some pretty ugly cases. uh, on Long Island, there were, there was a, a case where two individuals tried to set up a garbage company without playing ball with with organized crime, and um, and they were murdered. Um, okay. So it's you know it's it's something that uh, you know the organized crime took very seriously their ownership of the industry, so to speak. Dennis Hickey must have been making a tremendous amount of money because he had enough money to live this lavish, affluent lifestyle, but we know that he had to be giving a good portion of his money to organized crime in order to do so. The primary amount of money that he, the tribute payments that he had paid to organized crime was to the Colombo crime family, but the Colombos brokered uh, kind of a, almost like a a monopoly uh, for this area that the Columbos controlled this part of Long Island, uh, and 
then agreed that they would pay their garbage companies over which they exercise control, they would pay a certain amount of money to the Lucchese crime family, the, the, the companies themselves, and, an, and a certain amount of money to the Gambino crime family. So Hickey Carding was actually paying off three crime families, the Columbos, the Lucchese's, and the Gambinos. Um, what is your role in this investigation? So I was on the Asset Forfeiture Squad in New York, which the mission of the Asset Forfeiture Squad then and, and now was to conduct parallel financial investigations of major criminal cases, uh, and we tended to work on those that uh, had the greatest potential for asset forfeiture to you know, seize and, and, and forfeit assets to the government. And this, this case certainly seemed to have that kind of potential. So I, um, you know, at, really at the outset, I teamed with Don McCormick, who, you know, who, who initiated this case, uh, to really work hand in hand with him in building out um, the financial case. So what's, you know, what's interesting, so he was, and, and the way, you know, the genesis of it was the bribery case. He, he bribed the scales official. He was debarred from doing business with the town of Islip. And then he came up with this scheme to defraud the town of Islip and to deceive them into thinking that he had sold or leased his fleet of trucks and, in effect, his customers to another carding company. Uh, he created this sham lease agreement that had the VIN numbers of all of the the garbage trucks that were owned by Hickey Carding uh and this you know contract drawn up that said the you know the customers and the vehicles for some period of time were now the property of another carding company in another town uh called Grand Carding and it was um uh, Joe and Angelo Carrion, who's who were first cousins uh, to the acting boss of the Colombo crime family, uh, Andy Russo, who was the one that brokered that deal. So this was a so they submitted so the guys that were operating Grand Carding submitted a, a permit. You know you need a permit to dump within the town a solid waste permit. So they had an existing permit. They submitted an amendment to their permit with the lease from Hickey Carding, the sham lease, to that amendment. And then the town issued additional uh, solid waste permits for each of the trucks. Uh, and then Hickey Carding continued to do business as it always had. But where it went horribly wrong for Dennis Hickey is he set up a bogus company called Grand East, and a bank account called the, in the name of Grand East, and then laundered the money through this account for the purpose of deceiving the town of Islip. So the way it worked is Grand Carding was getting charged for these dump fees that were Hickey's carding operating expenses, and, and obviously that wouldn't wouldn't it be fair to Grand Carding because it wasn't their expense. They were just doing this as an accommodation on because their the crime boss asked them to. So Hickey's Carding would then fund that Grand East bank account from its bank account and then cut checks to Grand Carding for the tipping fees from the town of Islip. And that artifice became kind of the nucleus of the money laundering case uh, being brought against Hickey's Carding. The other thing that uh, Hickey's Carding did was they commingled all of the proceeds of this. Now, really, as in effect, all of Hickey's Carding revenue, since it was done illegally by defrauding the town of Islip, because they weren't supposed to be doing business in the town of Islip, they were debarred. So all of their revenues were the proceeds of money laundering. And the Ooh. proceeds is specified, specified on lawful activity because it was an illegal operation. And then add to that, they commingled all their personal assets with their company assets and s subjected all of their personal holdings to asset forfeiture and money laundering charges as a result. Can I just ask sure. you a question? Is Grand Carding... Were they a legitimate company? Were they actually in the garbage hauling business? They, they, they were. They were a small company in uh, another part of Long Island, but that they had a, a permit to dump in the town of Islip. But they were also Colombo crime family associates. So 
so it was keeping it all in the family, so to speak. So Andy Russo, in addition to you know, brokering this deal that enabled Hickey's Carding to operate, and the other funny thing, there are a lot of funny things about this case, but Hickey's Carding, bright red garbage trucks, and every each of them on the back, it said, have you called your mother today? <laughs> so they were very recognizable, you know, unmistakably Hickey's Carding garbage trucks, but the way that they perpetuated this fraud uh, is they had these magnetic signs made up that said Grand East Carding and then just put them on the doors over the Hickey's, Hickey's Carding logo on the doors, but everything else remained the same, so it wasn't like they were tricking anyone. Uh, but that was uh, if they were ever stopped. I guess that's how, that's how, that's that would been would have been their their defense. So the township of Islip just took it on paper that Dennis Hickey was no longer operating, and that was the end of it. They did no um, investigation of their own. Yeah, and, and had they done that, they would have seen the trucks were still deploying from the same yard that they always had. You know, the the drivers were all the same, the routes were all the same, the customers were all the same. It was all the same trucks. The only thing was that um, Grand Carding was um, on paper responsible to pay the town of Islip for the tipping fees, the the dump fees that that were being incurred. That was the only the only difference. Uh, but yes, they they, um, they they weren't exactly uh, Johnny on the spot. Um, right, doing their due diligence and uh, checking everything off. So so this um, this scheme. Uh, so he was convicted in 1987. He did this amended application through this uh, money laundering scheme with the carry owns and Grand Carding, and then created Grand East carding as kind of the money laundering conduit. Um, this ran from 1988 to 1995. Um, so m- many millions of dollars were laundered through this ongoing scheme. Uh, Andy Russo, who is the acting boss of the Colombo crime family, um, one of the ways that we first identified that he was kind of uh, intimately involved is that um, – so. I think Andy Russo was actually in prison when he brokered this deal. Uh, But when he was released, uh, two things happened. One is that um, Dennis Hickey gave him a no-show job. So he he put him on the payroll of uh, Hickey's carding, but, you know, he never came to work. But also we saw checks. We we looked at 4 million checks in the course of investigating this case. And, And I personally looked at 4 million checks. And we found some checks to something called Sleepy Hollow Hollow Real Estate. You know, that one sort of stood out because it was unusual. And I was looking to see, because he he already owned a lot of real estate, uh, Hickey, not just his estate home, but multiple homes on multiple undeveloped piece, plots of land as well. So initially I thought maybe you know, maybe he had purchased another piece of property. Uh, but I checked uh, FPI indices and I found uh, another Colombo crime family case uh, assigned to another agent. And I, uh, so I got on the phone with him and he said, oh, yeah, Sleepy Hollow Real Estate, that's a sham company. And it's Andy Russo. And it's, you know, it's his house in Old Brookville, um, which is a you know, nice community on Long Island, very nice. It's called Sleepy Hollow Estates, and it's you know, and and that's that those are just checks that are for the benefit of Andy Ro- Russo. And sure enough, you check the you know the the company, and it's you know it's it comes back to that uh, address that uh, where uh, Andy Russo and his family lived at the time. So he was actually making his payoffs. By check, it seems kind of strange that well, he would he was do that. His mortgage, <laughs> his, the, part of his compensation was uh, Dennis. Dennis Hickey was paying the mortgage on his um, very nice high-end home in Old Brookville, New York. Oh, okay. So this this Sleepy Hollows real estate held the mortgage on his on his well, estate. Well, it, it was just a shell company. It didn't. Oh, okay. Really, okay. It was not. Oh, I see. Okay, so that's what he's saying. The check was. With right, it was pay, it, it, exactly. It was, and there okay. was a legal entity, Sleepy Hollow Real Estate, but that was the um, 
that was the extent of it. It was that somebody had gone so far as to establish a, a corporation called Sleepy Hollow Real Estate, um, but it was, you know, <laughs> the bank account was then just used to to pay Andy Russo's mortgage. Okay, okay. so uh, he might have in the uh, in the memo section, you know, mortgage payment, but really all it was was uh, you know the, the, the kickback going to uh, to to Russo. And, and actually, you just hit upon one of the really interesting things about the case is, so um, Dennis Hickey's wife was the bookkeeper, and um, she wrote all of the checks over this entire scheme, all of the commercial checks, all of their personal banking, and she was meticulous. And she wrote detailed memos in every single check that she wrote. It was this trove of information. Ooh. Like the likes of which I had never seen and have never seen since. You know, at some point we were building a behavioral science profile on Dennis Hickey with an eye toward maybe trying to flip him. And there was this questionnaire that we had to complete about him to, you know, in an effort to try to profile him. And there were some really obscure questions like, what era does your subject identify with? What type of music? does he listen to, um, what movies does he enjoy, things that you would have no way of knowing. And yet, because of the detail in the checks, I actually was able to answer all those questions to the point where the person building the profile for us called us up and said, how did you know all of that stuff? I've never seen a questionnaire completed as thoroughly as, as you guys completed this questionnaire. And it was... Absolutely, because of this, the volume of checks that we looked at and how meticulously Maria Hickey um, uh, filled out the memo section of those checks. What kind of things did she put in there? Well, she was a big Franklin Mint person, she and I guess her husband. So they would buy all these like commemorative plates with Marilyn Monroe and all of this 50s stuff. You know, and then they were also like, remember Columbia House, where you bought the CDs, right? Um, mm-hmm. And and you know, she would you know write Wait, in the memo. There's more. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but if you write in the memo, exactly which artists you know that that the CDs that the check was payable to Columbia House for, and it was it was Elvis, and it was you know Frankie Valley, and you know it was really um, it was it was a. Fascinating, and it was funny. Is I, I didn't even know I had that information until I started filling out the questionnaire, and I was like, I actually know the answers to these questions from having looked at these checks over and over again. That's a little added uh, extra that you got there. Yeah, yeah, you know, it really was uh, was it was an interesting uh, uh, kind of a side benefit to, to have that that uh, that insight and the and the way we came about having getting that insight. For most of my career, that's what I work: white collar crime. I, I did economic uh, fraud, you know, Ponzi schemes, advanced fee schemes, telemarketing fraud. And I thoroughly enjoyed going through boxes of documents and looking for things. Uh, talk to me about, you know, your interest in doing that because obviously, you know, you love it too. I, I do. And, and I have to say it, 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 um, it, it, it didn't happen overnight. <laughs> it was... Uh, you know, when my first office, I was assigned to a white collar crime squad, and you know, when I went to my mail slot on the very first day, I had you know 30 new white collar co- cases across a whole spectrum of violations, and you know, and and you know, from that point on, I was always surrounded with bank records and accounting records, and uh, and and I. So you didn't have that background. What were you doing exactly before you joined the FBI? Well, you're going to laugh because uh, I, I, um, I was I was tending bar <laughs> and, uh, and managing a restaurant, kind of a, a stopgap waiting to get on with the bureau. I had uh, been working for my dad for a while and I loved working with my father. And it was uh, I would never change a thing in terms of working with him because we got, you know, to have an adult relationship, that, you know, that we we'd not had previously. But I, I didn't enjoy the work. And I had the application pending with the uh, with the FBI, but I, I just didn't want to continue to do outside sales, which is really what I was doing, you know, kind of like the proverbial door to door salesman, which just just wasn't me. And uh, went back just on an interim basis back into the restaurant business until 
you know, when I was very hopeful that the the, the bureau uh, opportunity was going to come through, and it did. And in the FBI, you have to be able to talk to all types of people, you know, CEOs and and junkies and everywhere in between. And I think it helps you. Uh, it certainly helped me in my in transitioning to my FBI career because you know, on any given day, you could be talking to anybody, and you right. have to be able to modulate between you know, the different types of folks that you may come into contact with in any given day. Yeah. And it makes you relatable. I'm sure there were situations where you were talking to somebody trying to gather information and the fact that you could talk about working uh, as a bartender or in restaurants helped to break that, uh, you know, that, that, that chasm between the two and make you more relatable. Yeah, I, I think so. I think it certainly helped me. And I, I think just, you know, again, just... You know, in, in uh, you know they teach you in you know in when they teach you how to do uh, interviewing is you know how the importance of establishing rapport that came pretty naturally to me, and I think that's a function of you know some of the things I did prior to to becoming an agent. Hmm. And yeah, that's really interesting. I remember vividly the very first day at the academy. Um, I can't remember. Uh, I, I, had, I had some great instructors at the academy some of the funniest people I've ever met. I remember one of them saying um, that, you know, congratulations, you've just made it through one of the most selective hiring processes that there is. And at the time I came on board, the Bureau was getting between forty-two and 50,000 applications a year for 400 special agent positions. Had I known those were the odds, I don't know that I would have put in. So I was I was very happy to hear that after the fact because that's, yeah, uh, that's, that's that's pretty daunting. All right, so let's go back to since I love white collar crime so much, I'm always trying to sell it to to different people. So you said initially when you were assigned some of those cases, you weren't that happy, but you grew to love paper cases. I, I had a I think an, an inaccurate preconception of what white collar crime was and just the name i think just uh at least in my mind um wrong headedly as it turns out sort of invokes like you know for some reason i thought that would be dry you know i you know the, they they don't make movies about you know or at least back then they didn't make movies about white collar crime they you know it's bank robberies and organized crime and you know and and, and um serial killers you know, exactly so uh <laughs> So I, I think I was just like, really, you know, I'm going to Memphis and I'm not going to, you know, do door kicking and all that other stuff. Turns out I, I did it every day because it was such a small field office down in Memphis. But, um, but you know, what I really came to uh, enjoy and realize is that some of the white collar crime cases were much more challenging, much more complex. You know, bank robbery is a pretty straightforward thing to investigate. Trace, tracking fugitives is pretty straightforward. It's great work. It's it's an important job. It's got to be done. You know, same with like drug trafficking. You know, these are um, you know important things, property crimes, but they are very straightforward crimes for the most part, right? You're not going to find it to be overwhelming because the the concept is pretty straightforward. Um, some of the white collar crime cases that, and I'm sure you had the same experience, were ingenious. You know the 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 schemes that people come up with the the way they go about laundering the money the uh, particularly things like Ponzi schemes these interlocking storylines and the way that they compartmentalize these big telemarketing schemes was a testament to American ingenuity albeit <laughs> psychopathic uh, American ingenuity and I just um, at some point very early on I kind of it, it like a light bulb went off, and I said, "Well, this is, you know, this is this is what I want to be doing." I loved it then, and I still love it. You know, I still do my fraud of the week, you know, cases because, as you said, it's just amazing the things that people do in order to take other people's money. Just absolutely amazing. No, All right, I, so let's I go agree. back to the case. We've been away from the the, the case so long, so now you found that. Uh, some of the fictitious companies and fictitious checks and money laundering schemes that uh, Hickey and, and, and his wife are, are, are involved in. So tell us more. So you know the um, you know the, 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 at the heart of this is they you know as I stated earlier 
the town of Islip was trying to prevent them from doing business. They created this whole elaborate scheme in order to continue to do business and had to, you know, uh, go through these extra steps to kind of launder the proceeds uh, of their revenues, um, launder, you know, to take the proceeds of the laundered money and give it back to the the carry owns to reimburse them for the tipping fees. They commingled all of these assets with their assets, and ultimately put the government in a position to be able to to argue that the payments to um, Andy Russo, um, the payments to the Lucchese crime family, to Joe and Carmine Avellino, who were Somebody ranked them the 10 most violent Lucchese crime family soldiers. I, I don't know who comes up with that <laughs> assessment and what the criteria are, but, uh, uh, but, but since they were responsible for the two murders I res- alluded to earlier, uh, I, I, that should put them in the top 10 anyway, but, um, um, and, and the payments to the Gambino crime family, they, they, they took the money laundering as a predicate uh, as well as a whole series of other things. But by making it a RICO case, they were able to bring in the bribery of the scales official. They were able to bring in evidence from other cases, organized crime cases. They, they wouldn't be able to use all that if it weren't, weren't a RICO case. But it really was a, a fascinating case, and, and the way all of these things um, kind of coalesced, all of the Bureau's institutional knowledge on the carding industry and organized crimes control over the carding industry from the civil RICO case, from other criminal cases, from other organized crime cases uh, involving those three crime families. So um, it really was an interesting, almost microcosm into into um, you know organized crimes control over the carding industry. And you know the uh, the great thing about it is the outcome. At the end of the the day, uh, Dennis Hickey pled guilty. He um, he did it as part of a plea deal so that his wife and his son didn't have to go to jail. His son was very involved in the business as well. Um, and um, they agreed to f- forfeit uh, $6.9 million, pay a fine uh-huh. of $7.5 million. Uh, what about and, their property? Well, that was part of it, right? They liquidated the properties as part of the uh, asset forfeiture deal. That's how they were able to pay off some of these things is they – they did uh, asset sales, and then the proceeds of those asset sales then were, went toward the fine and the uh, and the asset forfeiture that they agreed to. And then ultimately, and I think this is probably the best outcome, is they sold the the companies. Um, they sold the Hickey's Carding companies to a company that was not controlled by organized crime, and the the Carry Own sold their company to a publicly traded private sanitation company. So, what nice thing too is that the business, you know, the industry had ridded them rid of themselves of uh, of um, Dennis Hickey and the Carry Owns. Now, would you say that's the case of the entire? Uh, sanitation, garbage sanitation industry, is there still, as far as you know, a connection or some type of association with organized crime, or, or is that gone now? So there were, in the 80s and 90s, a huge amount of cases against organized crimes control of the private sanitation industry, both the federal um, government and the New York uh, DA's office and some of the other metro area DA's offices. And I would say that organized crime still is present, but they no longer have a stranglehold on the industry. Not so construction. Construction, they still have the stranglehold. So, I mean, I think the, the government, and it's the combined government, federal government and, and, the, and the state agencies investigating organized crime, together really broke the back of organized crimes control over the carding industry. And it's a great story. Yeah, it certainly is. And it really is for me. I, I, I hope the listeners also enjoyed hearing about how, you know, paper evidence can bring down organized crime. So what are you doing now? So I, um, I I continue to do what I've always done is is investigate financial crime. Um, I, I no longer kick doors in unless my son locks himself in the bathroom. But uh, uh, I um, I continue to do what I enjoy. I, I lead 
Um, um, I'm the global leader of a, of a forensic accounting practice that does event-driven fina- financial crime and, and bribery investigations here and, and overseas. Um, we also are very active in anti-corruption advisory and uh, fraud risk advisory and you know, work primarily for, for large companies, financial institutions, law firms. What's the name of the, the company you work for now? Uh, it's called Protivity. I'll put a link to that uh, in the show notes. Now, I know you're still very much connected. You were with the FBI for almost 10 years, but you still have a connection to the FBI. Could you tell us a little bit about that, too? Yeah, I do. Well, I mean, it's, um, and it's, you know, like, I think I speak for all of us as a FBI community that, um, you know, once you're an FBI agent, um, you're you're kind of always an FBI agent. Uh, you, you may not have the credentials anymore. You may not and draw a paycheck from the FBI but it becomes part of who you are and, and, and part of your identity and you're part of the uh, the fabric of something larger. You know, there's this um, continuum and I think uh, it's really um, been given um, a little bit of a new life w- under the current director who uh, I, I think uh, Director Comey sees the uh, very significant benefit of engaging with what he terms alumni, and I've seen that, and I think you've 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 been to some of these quote alumni events, and it I think it's great, uh, and because I think it's such an important conduit between the private sector and the FBI, the you know the, the former agents that are out in the uh, you know in the private sector but continue to you know to to be in contact with the FBI. I mean, you know, listen, the work that we do, and my friends are usually very happy to hear from me because. Um, I've got a criminal referral, a confession, all the evidence. <laughs> it's uh, you know, nice little packaged up uh, right. case for them. Yes, yes. It's, I have like all, all I haven't done is fill out the five fifteen for them. So, uh, so <laughs> and five fifteen for our listeners is the uh, stat form where you record uh, your statistics, indictments, and and uh, you know, sentencings and and things like that. <laughs> The good old five fifteen. I forgot about that. Yes, yeah, yeah. Another one yeah. of our forms. Yes. Well, that's fascinating, and that's uh, you know I've really enjoyed uh, talking to you, and uh, I thought I would give you an opportunity, and you have a little bit, but you know another opportunity to just give like a closing statement about your time, you know, with the bureau and and how you feel about the FBI today. Well, hey, listen, I am. Um, I'm blessed to have been able to to serve as an FBI special agent. Some of the most extraordinary people I have ever met were colleagues of mine in the FBI. Uh, It is a unique uh, organization, unlike any other organization in the world, and you do amazing things. Uh, I, you know, on many occasions said to myself or said out loud, but for no one's benefit, um, I, I can't believe I get paid to do this. (laughs) <laughs> this is just an amazing, amazing thing. You see things that um, most people only read about uh, in your in your FBI career, and you know many of them you know aren't front page news, but there it's such important work, such an amazing thing. You know I think there's a lot of careers where you know there isn't this clear mission behind that your profession. There isn't this clear mandate or you know, um, um, clear distinction between what's right and what's not. And I think, you know, the FBI, it's a lot clearer. You know, it's, um, you know, it's, it's an, it's, it's a, it's a mission, it's a calling, and it's an, it's an amazing thing to have been a party to. You know, I think, you know, listen, the FBI had to change fundamentally after 9-11. Human beings don't like change, you know, so, you know, as the FBI went through some of its very significant changes, you know, there were some, you know, I'm sure some discomfort along the way. Um, you know, I see the FBI today. I see the FBI the way it was 20 years ago when I left, and it, it's you know every bit as strong, every bit as extraordinary, uh, filled with unbelievable, un- unbelievably talented, passionate people. You know, I, I mean, I just see you know this, uh, you know, the, the the best is yet to come out of, out of the FBI. 
And that's the end of the interview. As always, back at jerrywilliams.com, you'll find photos of Scott and you'll find newspaper articles about the garbage hauling case that he talked about. If you enjoyed the episode, I hope you share it with your friends and family. I make it easy for you. I have all the social media share buttons at the bottom of this episode's show notes. Now don't cut off the recording until you hear my crime fiction recommendation for this week, because I really, really enjoyed this book. I picked it up, not even knowing that the FBI was involved in the story. It is called Cold Fear by Rick Mofina. And uh, you spell Mofina, M-O-F-I-N-A. The book is about a young family, mother, father, little girl, and their dog who go camping in the rugged corners of Montana's Glacier National Park. It starts off with a little girl who wanders away from her parents and becomes lost. And it turns into a procedural thriller with a multi-agency task force launching a massive search to find the girl. Things turn bad for the family. All of these agencies, the National Park Service, the San Francisco Police Department, the FBI, behind the scenes start to become suspicious about the little girl's parents. Were they involved? Was this foul play? Even though as the reader, you know that she's simply just lost watching the agencies work as they try to figure out what's going on and how bad things could get for the parent is absolutely thrilling. Again, my crime fiction recommendation for this week is Cold Fear by Rick Mofina. And while you're picking that up at Amazon.com, take a look at Pay to Play about corruption in the Philadelphia strip club industry. Before you go, I want to remind you that I have created a FBI G-Man 2017 calendar, the PDF file to use as is, or you can print out as many copies as you want, and that I am giving it away for free for anyone interested in joining the FBI Retired Case File Review True Crime Crime Fiction Newsletter. You can sign up for that newsletter on my website, jerrywilliams.com. That's J-E-R-R-I williams.com. This episode was sponsored by fbiretired.com, the only online directory made available to the general public featuring retired FBI agents and analysts interested in showcasing their skills to secure business opportunities. I want to thank you for listening, and I hope you come back again for another episode of FBI Retired Case File Review with Jerry Williams. Thank you.